I want to welcome everybody. My name is Paul North. I'm a professor in the German department at Yale. And this is the first in a series of workshops that carries the title, The Value of Marx's Capital. Obviously a little play on words there. I want to start each of these episodes with a quote from the author who has been kind enough to come to our screens. And this is a quote from Terrell Carver, who's with us today. It goes like this. Quote, no one who wants to read a work of history, even a history of capitalism, will find this book easy to understand. He's referring to Marx's capital. But then he adds, capitalism is not an easy phenomenon to grasp or an easy one to live through. Um, I want to recognize a whole bunch of people as we're starting. First, the director of the Whitney Humanities Center, Alice Kaplan for being kind enough to let us try this experiment in the middle of a pandemic. I want to thank Sandra Malan Bowles for her incredible organizational skills and Leanna Hirschfeld Crowen, who is the graduate student that has pulled this all together. I want to thank also Yasmin, who is going to handle the technical parts here. This is a, a set of workshops that run in tandem with a seminar uh, in which there are about 25 undergraduates who are reading through Marx's Capital very carefully. Um, so I want to welcome the students in the seminar. And then I'd like to thank the Frankie family for making possible these lectures, the Frankie Lectures in the Humanities. That is Richard and Barbara Frankie, who gave this money to present important topics in the humanities to a wide and general audience. One of the reasons we're doing this is because I am involved in a project to edit a new translation into English of Marx's Capital Volume 1. And I have to thank my collaborator for that, Paul Ryder of OSU, whom I want to introduce to you now. I'm not sure you'll be able to see him, but he will come in later when uh, it's question time. Paul Ryder is a translator of some note, also a scholar of German studies, and he is rendering Capital Volume 1 into an English that you can uh, understand and that will also delight you. This volume should come out with Princeton University Press in 2022, we hope. Now, it's a great pleasure to introduce Terrell Carver, who is a professor of political theory in the School of Sociology, Politics, and International Studies at the University of Bristol in the UK. Terrell Carver has been a visiting fellow at the Research School of Social Sciences of the Australian National University at the Center for Asian and Pacific Studies at Seikei University in Tokyo. He has been visiting professor in the States and um, many other times in uh, Australia, in the Far East. Most notable for our interests is that he was a member of the editorial commission on the German Marx Engels edition, the Marx Engels Gesamtausgabe, the, uh, otherwise known as the MEGA, which is the most significant event in the textual fund of Marxian writings ever, it seems to me. Terrell Carver specializes in Marx, Engels, and Marxism, and on the philosophy and methodology of social science. He has written widely on um, political theory, but has a a big bookshelf on Marx and Engels. Specifically, he wrote the book on Marx, or a book on Marx, that is Marx in Polity Press from 2018. There are many books on Marx, but there are very few books on Engels. And Terrell Carver, I think you would have to admit, is the world expert on Engels. He wrote the book many years ago now, but it's still a very important book, Marx and Engels, The Intellectual Relationship. There is no Marx without Engels, as I'm sure Terrell would agree. Uh, this book is from 1984. He wrote The Life and Thought of Friedrich Engels, which came out in 1990 and was reissued this year and was a co-editor on Engels before Marx, which is a very important book to understand where Engels came from. I'd like to give the microphone over to Professor Carver, but first I want to thank him for a, a book that was important for me that's the postmodern Marx, which came out in 1998. That's the first book that made me think 
I wanted to read Marx. So thank you and welcome. Uh, well, I'm uh, delighted and honored to be here and uh, really pleased to hear that comment about uh, that particular book. Uh, I wish you'd been a reviewer, uh, but uh, we'll uh, get on with the plot uh, here this evening. I'm also delighted to hear that it's a workshop, so I expect to work out and uh, I expect the audience to work too. I think there are a lot of you. Uh, and I'm sorry I can't see every, everybody and in, interact in uh, that way, but we'll do what we can uh, with this medium. Uh, thanks particularly to uh, Liana and uh, Yasmin for uh, helping me along through um, some of this, and I'm still tackling uh, the Yale forms uh, as we speak, uh, but everybody's very patient. Uh, just a little bit of background. Uh, I've been in the UK for quite a long time, but I am actually originally American. So I'm just mentioning that so uh, that we don't uh, feel the need for a lot of intercultural uh, translation exercises. Uh, I actually um, graduated from Columbia in 1968. I went to high school with a flag out the front and took the SATs and did all of that. So uh, I'm not a visitor who sort of uh, dropped in from Mars, although uh, Paul North did say that with this on, uh, I look like a helicopter pilot. So uh, I thought we'd uh, whoosh up and get going uh, with a few slides just as a kind of warm up. So I'll see if I can share the screen here and um, set up uh, PowerPoint, which looks like it's actually working uh, right now. So uh, I've called this talk, um, Das Kapital uh, Critique, History and uh, Knowledge. Uh, and I'll explain why I've called it that. And this is a bit of a framing exercise uh, that sets up a uh, philosophy and methodology so that what I say about um, Capital, the text, and about Marx makes some kind of sense. Perhaps there's a bit of a health warning in that you probably won't get this kind of outlook or this kind of approach from the other speakers in the series, most of whom I know, uh, and some are quite close colleagues. Um, but um, I hope it's uh, refreshing. Uh, and there's a bit of a methodological angle. I'm kind of inclined, as uh, Paul North will know from the postmodern Marx, uh, to take an idea and put it out very clearly in um, what some people consider to be an extreme and unsettling form, uh, just to see how much mileage there is in the idea and what kind of pushback uh, there is on it. So there should be some lively debate uh, this evening. So if I can change the slide, uh, there we are. I think it's quite important in these uh, exercises, uh, whether literary or political theory, to um, get visually acquainted with who it is that we're making speak to us or imagining uh, talking to us through the text. So um, here we have two images of Marx. These are actually the first images uh, after the early 1840s, the early photographs. Uh, the one on the left, uh, 1861, and the one on the right, 1867, just the year that uh, um, Capital is published for the first time. So changing the slide. Um, this is the way I like to think about Marx. This is him in his uh, university uniform uh, as a Prussian student. He's about 22 and he's just on the turn of leaving university, getting his PhD by post, which is a great idea, uh, and uh, leaving academia for forever. And it's quite important to understand how repressive, reactionary, neo-feudal, know-nothing um, the German uh, kingdom states, principalities, uh, disunited as they were into 
40 odd units plus the Austrian Empire. Uh, how reactionary, unmodern uh, this was uh, in terms of being repressive. Uh, and uh, this applied to the university. So his um, main tutor was uh, chased out of the university. Uh, Carl knew that he was never going to get a university job and he gave up on that pretty quickly. So uh, the book on the left is um, the sort of volcanic one of 2018 that Paul North was uh, talking about. And the uh, first chapter is called Making Marx Marks. So there are two things going on here. It's a kind of, kind of double hermeneutic really. Um, that is, we have him here as a student about to take a great turn in his life and embark on making himself himself. But the himself as he made himself isn't really the same guy that he became in what we call his uh, reception or how he was constructed and written up uh, for the history books and for the record. So that latter story starts in the very early 1870s and it's quite difficult to explain to people now how obscure he was, how unfamous he was, how there were lots of other guys around uh, who didn't appear to be that much different. Most of the memoir uh, that we have uh, date from 40 years later. So people constructed an idea uh, after the fact about what he was like. Uh, and then we can project that back into the letters and other things that we have are actually contemporary with this process. But uh, methodologically, I'm quite keen to unpick and unpack uh, that kind of enterprise. So in the early 1870s, he was uh, constructed uh, as a guru, and in a sense, a kind of found, founding father of German socialism, right at the moment, uh, just after the introduction of the Imperial Constitution in 1871, when really for the first time, uh, at least a few people could vote for something uh, that might make some difference, although in practice, probably not very much. Again, it's a battle historically to try to explain to people how deeply undemocratic uh, even the constitutional regimes of the times uh, actually were. Universal manhood suffrage didn't hit the United Kingdom till the 1880s, for instance, and here we are uh, only in the early 1870s um, in um, the Reich. Uh, so uh, at this point, uh, the two branches of the socialist movement are getting together to unite. One uh, had been led by Ferdinand La Sala. He was rather conveniently dead. Uh, and it's quite easy to uh, honor people when they're dead and they don't get in the way anymore. Uh, and those who um, had uh, Marx as a um, mentor by correspondence, because of course he was um, living in London, and who visited him from time to time and were younger, uh, thought that their grouping within socialism, their proto-political party, um, should have honorary founders to rival the um, Ferdinand La Sala, who was really quite famous uh, in uh, the German states at the time, which Marx was not. He had a certain notoriety as a uh, 48er who'd gone into exile because he was prosecuted for treason. Uh, but that was about it. So at that point, Marx and Engels were created and constructed as important thinkers. Uh, and at the time that was done, um, not with Das Kapital, which was recently published, but with the Communist Manifesto of 1848. Marx and Engels were quite puzzled by this and a bit standoffish. And so I sort of wrote saying, uh, that thing is 25 years old. Nobody's read it since. We've really pretty much forgotten it. It does get one footnote um, in Das Kapital, interestingly, but nobody in 1867 could have got hold of a copy. Uh, most of the copies had been seized by the Prussian police. Um, it was really a rare 
pamphlet. So they said, why on earth don't you write your own, which is, you know, one for now, which is quite a reasonable political question. However, they were persuaded to go along with this uh, process of um, constructing um, icons and being made into symbols and uh, gurus uh, who would have works which were, were then uh, republished uh, through the later 1870s, 1880s. Uh, and this is part of the uh, political story of socialism uh, as an intellectual movement. So if uh, we go right back to uh, the, the beginning, what actually happens uh, with young Carl here as he's about to leave university and can't get an academic job where exactly does he go? Uh, he goes to a newspaper office that is in Cologne, not that far um, up the river. Uh, a group of businessmen and fringe intellectuals of the uh, sort who are dedicated to popular sovereignty, liberalism, tinges of socialism derived from French thinking. There are a little collective who want to get a newspaper together. This is actually quite difficult and he becomes uh, an associate and he tells us in his own autobiographical sketch of 1859 that it's in this office uh, where he first made contact with what he calls quote material interests unquote. Well, this is a well-known biographical fact, but I've chosen in chapter one in this book to pause on that and try to think it through quite carefully. So here we've got a university student from a, a professional intellectual background um, in Trier, uh, provincial backwater, uh, comes to Cologne uh, where some enterprising types are dedicating uh, themselves to politics, trade, and commerce. This is quite a big jump for an intellectual and Marx clearly found it uh, really stimulating. In other words, from his education in philosophy, history, and jurisprudence, he had learned really nothing about trade, commerce, uh, and what industry right, might be like, given that in uh, the German states there really uh, was hardly any, and then uh, tucked away um, in um, rather nasty little pockets. So in this office, we don't know very much about what happened. So not very much of this gets written into the historical record. We know who the businessmen were, who were the backers of the paper and who were um, would be editors. We know whom they wanted to be editor, which wasn't Marx, it was actually Friedrich List, the uh, becoming famous uh, political economist uh, in the German speaking lands. So this was quite a new uh, kind of scientific subject. And it's important to understand that in this kind of neo-feudal reactionary order, making money through trade and commerce was not very nice. It wasn't something that uh, rulers really very much wanted. They wanted peasants with taxes and to, uh, you know, uh, have an easy life and uh, be landowners and not have modernizing change. So um, within this uh, reactionary regime, uh, the press is strictly controlled as is uh, even conversation on subjects that are taken to be political, which certainly includes anything to do with religious doubt. Um, and uh, the police are around snooping on people and giving them warnings uh, and all that kind of thing. And of course that had happened to Marx's father in Trier. So these are not inconsiderable kinds of things to reckon with when you're um, entering a newspaper office um, and getting involved with people who do believe in liberalization to a point. Uh, believing in popular sovereignty doesn't mean that you believed even in universal manhood suffrage, far from it. 
uh, most people who uh, believed in some version of popular sovereignty certainly didn't think that uneducated people uh, should vote. So the story of democracy is not really about the proclamation of votes for everybody. Uh, the story of democracy is really much more about whom can we uh, continue to exclude whilst including a few more than were there before. So that's a bit of background uh, that this um, chapter actually sets up. And I think um, that should do as a bit of an in introduction to um, how I conceive of Marx as an author, and in particular, as a political actor. And uh, I'll come on to that. First of all, let's go for some more visuals. Um, here we have um, Das Kapital, the book itself. Here's the first edition. Again, I think it's quite important in these things to get some sense of physicality in the original, so it's not a kind of disembodied uh, text that just exists in uh, logo world uh, as uh, meanings and concepts. It's actually a book written in German for German-speaking audience. Uh, that's what it's, it looked like. Um, we know from uh, the first chapter where Marx mentions his earlier uh, so-called half volume or first installment uh, to a critique uh, der politischen Ökonomie. Uh, and that's that edition, that little half volume of 1859. Um, some of my Germanist friends uh, can help me out here. Uh, I'm interested in the transition from the Gothic typeface to the Roman typeface. I mean, they, they were both around. I just wonder if anybody thinks there's any particular significance, whether in the place of publication or the target audience. I don't know. Uh, Gothic typeface, of course, was around till uh, well into the 20th century. And uh, my German course at Columbia, we all learned to read that. And I'm not sure that uh, undergraduates necessarily do that anymore. So um, here's a couple of um, things for us to look at um, to get us uh, in the mood and to looking the right direction. Part of this is to remind Anglophones, um, like ourselves in this gathering, um, that uh, this is a, a German writing in German for a German political audience. Marx's political world um, is really looking east. Uh, he looks westward to France for uh, culture for socialism, for communism, for intellectual stimulation, and for political economy uh, in the first instance. So educated in the Rhineland, he was completely fluent in French from an early age. And if you've seen the, uh, the recent biopic, Le Jeune Marx, or De Junge Marx, uh, that's something they actually got right in this um, German-Belgian uh, co-production. Uh, the characters in it uh, speak uh, quite indifferently to each other in German and French as they um, go along with suitable subtitling. Um, so uh, we know uh, that uh, in learning French, uh, he also learned uh, Roman style handwriting. I did actually discover or track down some uh, previously unpublished letters of his in London. Uh, and when these kind of fell out of a plastic bag on someone's kitchen table, um, I realized that I could read uh, his handwriting uh, quite easily on uh, some. And so I thought, well, that's because he's writing in English. But actually, he learned uh, to write cursive Roman when, uh, as a schoolboy, he learned French. Otherwise, he had the famously terrible handwriting in German cursive Gothic, which is almost impossible to decipher. Although, I mean, perhaps some of my colleagues here um, spend their time on uh, manuscripts from that era. So that's a little bit more background. Uh, I'm fighting against the idea uh, in the Anglophone world that um, having removed to London in 1849, 1850, and, having, uh, and living there the rest of their lives into the 1880s and 1890s, uh, Marx and uh, Engels became honorary Englishmen 
uh, and speak to us in English. And we now have 50 volumes of Marx uh, translated uh, into English. Engels is a completely different case, of course. His, his English was very fluent and uh, he wrote and published in a, from a, a very early age, uh, you know, barely 20, 21 years old, uh, uh, because his dad uh, took him on business to England. Uh, Marx's English was much more uh, rudimentary, learned rather slowly. Uh, he only got, got on with reading English authors as the 1840s uh, progressed, 1845-6. Uh, his first visit to England is in 1845 with Engels uh, to go to the library in uh, Manchester. And um, it's, uh, his, his English was workable and uh, he, he uh, for money, uh, got to write it quite fluently in uh, the 1850s and early 1860s. But I think it's important to remember that even in London, his politics is pretty much looking east and so looking west to the US uh, east coast and uh, the Midwest to the German speaking communities there. And some of you will know that some of his works were actually uh, published there uh, within that community. So a uh, little bit of um, philosophical uh, background just to uh, set things up. I've put critique down here um, to say that this is not just a method or a genre, uh, though it's that, but for Marx it's actually an ontology and an epistemology. So uh, this is where things get a bit um, radical or extreme or, uh, I mean, Paul North will know this from the postmodern Marx. That is, it's an ontology and epistemology that is what there is to know and how we know it of political intervention uh, in communicative practice. And the communicative practice is meaning making uh, as a repetitious uh, citational activity. So that perhaps uh, doesn't mean a lot on its own, but as the discussion goes on, uh, I think it will become uh, a little bit clearer. Uh, I, put every, I put history down um, to um, put a few more things. Uh, on the board. That is to say, within this ontology, epistemology of meaning making, everything is historical. Uh, human history making is what there is, and historiography is what we say about human history making that we want to say. And of course, a lot is excluded, uh, as we will know uh, from discussions uh, about historiography. Uh, and uh, inclusion and exclusion from about the last 40 years. This is because uh, everything is communicative if we want it to be communicative. Uh, communicative. Uh, that is, if we're making meanings, we project those meanings outwards and then we read them off as what the thing is or what it is telling us. Existence in a philosophical sense is therefore meaningful only within meaning. It's not something outside of meaning that is a validation point for meaning. So some people will recognize this um, and it uh, may seem a bit heavy for an intro, uh, but I hope it'll pay off or at least give you the idea of uh, how this is uh, set up and not perhaps what you ordinarily hear. So within this, um, knowledge is always and already purposive. Uh, it's not abstract. Uh, it's, nor is it unconnected with political projects. So one feature of capital, of course, is to argue that political economy, the economics of the time, is not a disinterested science done by scientists who stand uh, outside society and outside politics. Uh, it is rather itself a political project and it says some things and obfuscates or hides others. Uh, so that's all entirely fair enough and to be expected from this point of view. Uh, science, therefore, from Marxian perspective, and you can see this in very early writings, is technology, 
is industry, is commerce, is capitalism. So there's no kind of disinterested zone of pure knowledge. And ask anybody who knows any scientists where their money comes from. Um, and uh, you can see that uh, this is uh, an ongoing uh, idea. So um, the uh, working through of this uh, perspective in terms of uh, Marx and uh, his writings and how they can be approached. And I'm not saying this is the only way, but just that it might be an interesting and productive way. And it does make a bit of a change uh, for most people. This uh, philosophical perspective uh, is worked out uh, in a chapter in this book, uh, which is published. Um, it's chapter 13 and the title is there, Socializing Knowledge and Historicizing Society, Marx and Engels and the Manuscripts of 1845-46. So just um, to um, geek out on this, um, the argument is put through from the roughest pages of the manuscripts that have gone into the um, so-called German ideology is the so-called book with a so-called Feuerbach chapter. Uh, this argument is actually fleshed out from these very, very rough pages, which really are unique um, in the legacy because they're the only manuscript pages we've got where Marx and Engels are actually drafting things together. And the only pages that we've got where they're making extensive rough draft corrections, crossing out, change, changing one word literally you know, into another and rephrasing things as they go along. So I, uh, in those particular pages, which actually they excluded from the things they were drafting, I think probably on grounds they were too theoretical. Um, these pages are of interesting to us and the object here is not to turn Marx into a philosopher or uh, an economist, but uh, rather to see what an interesting uh, view of uh, society, knowledge and history arises uh, through this method of critique. Uh, and th therefore, I think you can see um, a vocabulary kind of moving from one word, one phrase, from one phrasing uh, to another uh, as that argument um, develops. So um, I'll leave the slides at this particular point um, and uh, do a little bit of reading. I did some pre-circulation of something that I've written on Capital. It's actually uh, 10,000 words. It's still in draft. Uh, it's going into uh, something that's written for historians. Um, it's called Bloomsbury, the publisher, uh, History, Theory and Method. Um, and it's written to a kind of template. So I'll read a few uh, excerpts uh, from that to pick out some quotes from this amazing book so that we actually get to hear some of Marx here uh, and not just uh, to hear uh, me. Uh, but uh, I thought it was quite an unusual and sort of puzzling choice um, in saying that this reference book chapter is going to be for historians uh, and is um, going to be about Marx and then choosing capital because it's not considered a work of history. It doesn't fit uh, historiography. Um, as a genre. Um, Marx isn't really rated as a historian by historians, uh, mostly. Uh, they've generally picked him apart where they have taken the view that he was doing history, but doing it badly. As I say, he never had an academic job, didn't want to be an academic historian or philosopher uh, or an economist. So I was quite puzzled uh, that they chose capital uh, and also uh, quite excited. Uh, but it is quite a stretch for historians as, indeed, as it is indeed for anybody uh, to pick up this book and start on page one. So quite a lot of this 10,000 words is uh, devoted uh, to uh, unraveling um, the, the kind of uh, 
uh, puzzle uh, that uh, Paul North gave me in the intro, that is, how on earth do we start reading this book and what do we make of it? Well, this kind of takes me back to the political um, context of the time. Virtually everything Marx uh, published, as opposed to just wrote down in notebooks or manuscripts, uh, had to get through a censor. And quite a lot of his life, he was trying to get published and dodge censors. Uh, and had all his difficulties uh, with that. And indeed, the newspaper that he joined in 1842 uh, was closed down by the censorship. So this is an ongoing uh, issue and a problem. It follows that if he wanted to say anything much uh, about politics, other than how good the rulers were, uh, you were um, going to be scrutinized very uh, heavily and uh, the rulers and the religious establishments were all entirely the same people. Uh, so um, you, you criticize their religion, you overthrow society, uh, you upset politics. There's certainly no division of anything there, quite uh, the opposite. So they're always kind of sniffing along on those uh, lines as well. Um, so, uh, like, uh, so, uh, Capital had to get around the censor, uh, like uh, all of Marx's works, uh, and indeed those of his contemporaries, the, uh, the people he's associated with uh, and writing with. Uh, they write it uh, for publication in a kind of code. It's got to be coded as uh, philosophy or eventually political economy. I think it's hard to make people um, understand that Marx writes about Hegel, not because he wants to have a philosophical battle with a dead philosopher, but because Hegel is a political issue and Hegel is a political issue because you can appear to talk about philosophy uh, and actually in a coded way be talking about politics. So you could get that kind of thing through the censor uh, and through the academic authorities, who of course um, made sure that conservative professors were appointed uh, to give official lectures on Hegel, and the uh, the more radical commentary uh, comes in the alternative uh, publications, and that's the kind of world that Marx grew up in, or um, got to know himself in. Uh, in the 1840s. So we've got that first um, difficulty with capital. What kind of coding is it? Uh, it's very uh, ironic. Uh, capital itself is a, uh, a satire. Um, he's uh, setting the political economists up for a fall. Um, he's um, fooling us really. Um, I mean, those of us in the know would know um, that he's going to pull the rug out from under them and that it's a critical work in a very serious sense and it's not a minor criticism. But to get this past the censor and indeed to get um, a, a, a gullible audience on board, particularly among the professors, uh, as he said, it's got to look like a sober, serious, a wissenschaftlich, scientific work of political economy. Uh, and indeed, uh, to a certain extent, uh, he thinks they were onto something uh, and got it right in certain respects, even if he didn't like their politics, but they also got it wrong in a way uh, that he thinks is really interesting and that he can do things with. So there's an element of parody here. It's a very good parody. Uh, it is a difficulty with parodies that if they're too good, the audience won't get the satirical difference between the parody satire and the real thing. So there are two reasons there why it's coded as a parody. One is to get it past the censor. The other is to get an audience on board and then whoops, pull the rug out uh, from under them, uh, which he does very neatly in uh, the final chapters, uh, part eight chapters uh, 26 to uh, 33. So I really argue that um, for, uh, all these reasons uh, and others. Capital is in a genre by itself. Uh, it's not going to fit history or sociology or philosophy. You've got to kind of get on board with the author who's setting his own genre and his own kind of context. 
but he's in difficulties trying to explain to you, particularly if you live, um, you know, 160, uh, uh, 70, 80 years later, um, you, that, you know, I mean, he's not going to know that. So the, there is that element of difficulty. The political economy, the economics of the time, is of course quite different from modern economics. And here Marx got a kind of rug pulled out from under himself. In the later 1870s, there was what was called the marginalist revolution in economics. Um, and the economists were uh, pretty suddenly thrown over uh, as passe and unscientific, not doing the right kind of thing in the right way, uh, obsessed with uh, value and uh, with a kind of philosophical moral problem, which was where does profit come from? Uh, whereas in the marginalist world, I mean, there really isn't a problem about profit. The only problem is uh, really uh, how do people make more of it um, and how to do that with numbers and empirical data, roughly speaking, and uh, to move out of the sphere of production where Marx and the political economists uh, were in the first instance into the fear of consumption. So modern uh, marginalist economics really starts from the point of view of the consumer with uh, consumers with money in their hands uh, ready to buy things and assume that uh, that is going to send a message to producers uh, via this uh, mechanism. So the whole thing is really turned upside down and inside out. Um, and Marx, I don't think, ever, ever realized that um, exactly. It was just something that was really quite different and from his perspective didn't make any sense. So um, the trying to translate a critique of political economy to make it accessible for modern readers is quite a stretch. So I congratulate the two Pauls um, in taking this on. It'll be fascinating. Um, to read the result. So uh, I'm not quite sure how, how I'm doing for time. Paul North, can you give me a clue, clue on this? If you're feeling like you're coming to an end, there's probably a lot of questions. Okay. Um, and you can fill in the details uh, in between people's questions. So thank oh. you for a great presentation and especially for setting capital and Marx into his context and its context. That's something that really was forgotten often in the readings of Capital. I want to give the first question to my collaborator, Paul Reiter. Go ahead, Paul. Thanks, uh, Terrell. It's great to, to meet you. Thank you for the, for the presentation. We, we've actually been in touch a little bit uh, as well over the summer and, and Terrell uh, is a translator of Marx too. And so uh, when he talks about the process of translating Marx with an air of sympathetic weariness or something, uh, you, know, you know where it comes from. Um, <clears throat> but he's produced some great translations and, and I, I admire his translations and uh, have read a bit about this argument uh, that capital is in a fundamental way a, a satire. And I wanted to ask you about that uh, to follow up a little bit, because one thing that I've, I've noticed in doing the translation is that when Marx translates passages from political economy into German, he engages in what you might call a, strong, a strongly domesticating form of translation, uh, meaning that he really integrates their writing into his so that uh, stylistically there's not much difference between the quotations in his German and his German. And you would think that uh, if he were looking to identify this or treat this as the object of his satire, that he would, that he would perhaps in some way keep it at arm's length from his own style. And the style in Capital, most of the time, it, is certainly not, I don't have the sense that it's meant to be a, a satirical style. It seems to be something that he really uh, tried to make into an effective instrument for conveying his, his, uh, his ideas. It's a, a really interesting style, a, a style that's very different from 19th century German academic prose. I mean, it's marked in various ways 
by uh, as as coming from that time there are all sorts of references i'm sorry about the dog barking dog there <laughs> the pleasures of zoom um, but uh, it also syntactically and, and in terms of word choices, it's so different from something like Lanka. It has this leanness, this sleekness to it a lot of the time. And he gives this political economy that's often really windy and florid and high, uh, mm -hmm. gives it a kind of leanness and tautness that it, it, it doesn't have, doesn't necessarily deserve. And so I'm wondering how that connects with this argument uh, uh, about the satirical agenda in, in, in capital? Um, well, that's an extremely good question. Um, he's doing a couple of things at once. It's not a straightforward satire. We know from the 1840s that he could write straightforward ad hominem uh, sarcastic satires. We know that from the Holy Family and the Poverty of uh, Philosophy, and we know that from the kind of ad hominem stuff that was going into the manuscripts that never actually had a title till 1902, when they became known as the German ideology. So we know he was very adept at that, uh, and he's not doing the same thing uh, in Capital. It's a parody. Uh, so it's going to sneak up on the reader. Uh, and uh, as the text progresses, you get more and more kind of sarcastic uh, comments, particularly in footnotes. Uh, but he's also at the same time uh, finding their work straightforward and valuable descriptively. That is, they are working with the concepts of ordinary people and ordinary commodity traders and merchants. Uh, and ordinary readers of newspapers like the one that he worked for, politics, trade, and industry. Uh, and what he's doing is, you know, writing both these things at the same time, as indeed the political economists were. They weren't importing concepts. Uh, they were reframing and clarifying the concepts that were already in ordinary usage. So Marx is quite on board with that because he's uh, looking at this clarified version of what actually goes on in commodity producing uh, society. And he's, and he's actually uh, buying into the puzzle about profit. Uh, and he's just coming up with a new concept and a solution that they hadn't come up with. But he's coming up with a solution that will pull the rug out from under them. And the solution, of course, is the exploitation of labor, the production of surplus value, uh, and that production uh, as the foundation of uh, capital as self-expanding value. So it's a very difficult book uh, in that way. But um, you may disagree, but uh, I always find his prose very straightforward, very lean, very taut, sometimes, um, you know, well, extremely sharp, very combative. I read all of Marx as political intervention from early 1842, and I mean all of it. Uh, he could write the kind of intellectualized journalism that he had to write at the time to get into the paper and to communicate to that audience. Um, but it's not uh, as difficult as later 19th century and certainly 20th century uh, academic German. Um, and certainly Marx's prose, I mean, his, his best prose work for me is the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte. I think it's a fantastic text, and it's the worst translation in the so-called standard ones into English that there is, um, done by uh, Daniel De Leon. So I really enjoyed retranslating that. Um, and it's um, really explosive, and uh, at the same time, colorful. So I, I think he's a fantastic writer in prose. If I had to pick something, uh, and my knowledge is not what yours is, as a kind of model, I would have picked the Lutheran Bible. I think that's actually, you know, direct stuff. Hmm. Thank you, Terrell. Thank you, Paul. We want to, I think there's a lot of explosive ideas in what you've been saying for the past hour or so, including that all of Marx's writing is a political intervention, not a science, for example not metaphysics, 
for another example. And we can talk about that. I want to just reiterate what this is for those who may have come in later. This is all of our chance to be TV radio announcers, I guess. Um, and none of us have trained for it. We should keep in mind here that we're being subsumed into the apparatus in a way that um, Marx described and others have described really eloquently and the conditions of our intellectual work have really changed a lot. It is a real pleasure to see how many people are here and I want to welcome you all. Um, you will notice that we've jumped into the middle and a lot of us take for granted that we've read Capital or know some things about Marx. Terrell gave a, a terrific introduction to the context, which is often forgotten. And the arguments we haven't really touched on today, but he knows them very well. So you're welcome to ask him questions about value or about uh, labor. What I'd like to do is um, I'd like to give the students in the seminar that is a regular college seminar that goes along with this workshop series, a chance to ask some questions. Uh, students, if you want to begin, if you put your questions in the chat, I will then somehow get to you. We'll unmute you and you can ask uh, Professor Carver yourselves. Then after that, we'll open up and uh, I'll let you know for the rest of those listening when you can put your questions in the chat. We, we really wanna to try to get to as many as possible. So for students in the class, I have already one in an email. This is from, I'm gonna read it since I have it here from Avery Youngblood, who's a student in the School of Art. I wonder what it means to quote unquote, shop small, AKA support your local businesses in terms of Marx's views on private property and work, workers versus non-workers. <laughs> there we go, right to the heart of the matter. Um, yes, I agree. Private property is uh, the heart of the matter, and this is something that Marx puts his finger on already in uh, 1842. There are some magic moments in his early newspaper articles, and this kind of brings me on to uh, my approach to the text um, for the modern reader, which is really to start at the end. Uh, to start in part eight, uh, the so-called uh, primitive accumulation, chapters 26 to 33, because I think those are the ones that make the most sense uh, at the moment. But to make sense of those, you have to see, uh, as he explains in those chapters, the centrality of the development of modern private property. So the story for Marx begins in 1842 uh, with an article on the dispossession of uh, feudal peasants from uh, forestry where they had rights um, subsistence rights uh, to do various things, pick up firewood or whatever uh, it was they needed. And so by uh, act of the local ruler, this was going to be uh, privatized, turned into a piece of private property, uh, sold off to an owner who would subdivide it and make farms. Uh, and they, they would all be stuck, uncompensated, uh, of course. So it's this process of uh, dispossession through which modern private property is created uh, that sets uh, commodity production uh, in motion uh, for Marx such that workers become available to employers because they haven't got anywhere else to go. And they can't go anywhere else because they're denied access to the land. So therefore, uh, they have to work for wages and uh, go into shops uh, to buy uh, processed food, so which is then uh, produced for profits uh, elsewhere in agribusiness uh, and packaging and processing. So this is essentially what's uh, already going on in England and Scotland in the late 18th century through uh, enclosures and dispossession and what is going on in the um, colonies and uh, including Ireland, plantations were set up in Ireland uh, and Virginia at the same time where uh, labor costs were driven as low as uh, possible and in the case of uh, imported uh, forced labor to North America driven down to zero. Um, so we know what that is. So property is the crucial concept and Marx's 
um, political intervention is to try to wake people up to what is underneath the normality of uh, clicking on Amazon, of going into a shop with a uh, chip and pin or however it is, or, you know, wireless connectivity or an Apple Watch. Uh, and uh, how the local global distinction is itself a misleading one. Um, I was, you know, reflecting on this only this morning and so uh, thinking about uh, the supermarket where I go and I thought, um, what are the flags that you see? Why do I see only Union Jacks and buy British and it tastes better because, it, you know, like tomatoes taste better because they're British. I mean, please. Uh, you know, if, if we had little flags all over all those other packets and labels, uh, particularly indicating supply chains, we'd have a much better picture of um, how, um, I'm avoiding the word ideological, but how mystificatory um, the local global uh, consumer's position is and how it takes away from the actual brutal hard facts of production, which is really where Marx is starting. Carol, are you saying, if I can just follow up, that um, the local is a fiction and that really the supply chains can't be avoided when producing something like that, or that the local is such a small fraction of the world economy that it's inconsequential? Uh, it's not a fiction, it's real. It's real because people use the words and they believe in the words and they organize their lives around uh, these words. But it's mystificatory and this is uh, going straight from Marx's uh, playbook, uh, Capital, uh, section on fetishism of commodities, uh, chapter one, section four. Uh, I believe you can uh, read the real stuff there where uh, he describes uh, how uh, economics and the political economy of his day and ours is a political project to uh, ensure that we see some things and don't reflect on others. So it will hit, um, I don't know, the Huffington Post and the news sites occasionally that uh, Apple workers in Shenzhen, uh, you know, have terrible working conditions. Well, what should we think about that? And, and what Marx is providing or trying to provide is a framework through which to understand that and to form a judgment. And he makes very clear uh, with um, sarcastic comments and eventually a thinly disguised pro programmatic one in um, chapter 27, I think. Uh, where he's coming from and what he thinks the solution is, but it's got to get past the sensor and we all have uh, issues with that. Thank you. I have two further questions from students in the seminar, starting with Bilal, who asks Professor Carver, well, let's see if Bilal can unmute. Can we unmute Bilal, let him speak for himself? This may require some technical magic. Oh yeah, Paul, before we get started, there's a couple of questions above if you scroll up. So there's one from a Jonas and then a Ryan Offman. So Jonas Koka also had a question above. Good. Let's, since I am going backwards, let's stick with Bilal for the first. If you okay. can, you can, then we'll just, we'll go backwards through the list. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Um, thank you, Professor Kava. Uh, I had a question uh, from your text. You'd mentioned other contemporary texts that share, uh, you know, the title capital and have a very similar approach. And you mentioned Piketty's capital in the 21st century. And uh, there are some, I mean, I saw similarities between Piketty's, you know, critique of capitalism and, and Marxist capital itself. But uh, the methods were quite different. It, it's not really a traditional Marxist approach. So I was wondering how Marx would react to you know, his findings about inequality in the 21st century and the world that, that you know, he describes. Uh, well, I think Marx would definitely buy the book and buy the next book um, about ideology in uh, capitalism, which uh, essentially uh, says what I've just said in the previous answer. Um, that is a lot of effort goes into helping us see things one way rather than another and not connecting the dots, you might say. So I see Piketty in both books as trying to connect up the 
dots that Mark said were there, but doing it with modern methods and particularly with an absolute avalanche of uh, empirical examples, data, statistics, and all of that. I think um, Marx was trying to get his hands on that, but of course in 1867, uh, statistics data collection really hardly exist. So I think one instructive thing in reading a text from out of the past like this is to uh, spend some time trying to think about and to find out about what sources and what knowledge of was even potentially uh, available to the person at that time. If you think about what Marx says about China and India, for instance, how could he have known much of anything? And in terms of the sources that he did have available, what in fact were they? This is still very early days in terms of even collecting uh, data that calls itself economic uh, about European countries. Um, and for uh, as far as uh, trying to understand uh, societies you know, outside Europe, I mean, this is really early days uh, also. So there just actually isn't um, very much there. I mean, even if um, I remember Darwin is only 1859, uh, and that's uh, the origin of species is built on um, geological knowledge from the 1830s, 1840s onwards, which was not accepted. I mean, um, I mean, Darwin was persecuted and had endless uh, problems for questioning the Bible. So if you look at the 1840s and ask, well, what could Marx possibly have known about the Roman Empire, the ancient world, uh, or uh, the ancient world outside the Roman Empire, you're not looking at very much. And quite a lot of it is going to be located in around the Bible and certainly filtered through that. So I think one has to bear all those things in mind. But I think you'd be delighted with Piketty's books. I think they're great. Can I follow up? Bilal, thank you very much. This is a little bit more of a provocation, I think, but um, Piketty in the first book called Capital focuses on inequality and his solution is something like redistribution through taxation. Do you think if Marx had the statistics that he would come down, he would have been a liberal? Um, well, I think there's, um little difference between Marx and liberals to start with, but there is some difference. So as I said, Marx is fully on board with popular sovereignty and universal male suffrage, which was actually in the French constitution of 1793. Uh, they just um, didn't put it into practice. Uh, and as um, I say, it was first put into practice in 1848. So um, remember, uh, you know, it's commonly said Marx is, you know, uh, very influenced by the French revolutionaries, but he's, ve he's very close to the French Revolution of 1830, which is the constitutional monarchy. I mean, that's, uh, that's in his lifetime. So I think, again, we need to, need to get um, close to where these people actually are to understand what it is that they're thinking about. Uh, and the suffrage is uh, somewhat widened at that point. So Marx does face a political dilemma from the beginning because as early as 1842, he's on to the private property thing uh, and the suffering of the peasants. So uh, on the one hand, the liberal businessman would like to get the peasants into the shops uh, with money. Um, and the government doesn't really want them into the factories because they don't really want factories. Um, and uh, the charity angle isn't working out. So what the businessmen are really upset about um, is the town filling up with beggars. This is going to be really annoying for people who want to shop. So that's why they want Friedrich List uh, to come in and um, help the um, Prussian government uh, sort themselves out. Um, but they don't want too much messing with private property or too much uh, redistribution. They just like some economic uh, organization of wage labor, uh, which they think would be quite beneficial. And if it requires disposition, uh, dispossession, that's quite okay with them. And actually it's quite okay with Marx uh, at that point, since uh, he's got to have allies, those who believe uh, in the collective ownership of property rather than the 
uh, ownership of private property, particularly in the means of production, such as land, uh, th th there's going to be a tension there. So he's got to keep that kind of quiet. Um, and Moses House was involved with this. Everybody was looking for a solution. So these people have got to work together. And that's what Marx did in the Rhineland. It's what he did in Paris. It's what he did in Brussels. Uh, there weren't enough socialists around and they weren't collected enough on what on earth they meant by collective ownership of property anyway um, to make much of a case. So they're still working that out. They're just trying to get rid of reactionary, you know, religious fanatic maniac um, authoritarian rulers who can be really, really annoying and uh, really frustrating and don't want anybody to vote for anything. Um, and even in uh, the French Republic, hardly anybody voted for anything anyway. So their first angle was democracy. And if you look at the end of the Communist Manifesto, part four, there's a list of demands, all of which are basically liberal demands, um, including nationalization of the banks and provision of uh, uh, work for the disabled and provision of work for everybody. Uh, and free public education, which is unknown at the time, uh, and all of those other kinds of things. It's not a word about the uh, abolition of private property. It's a strictly redistribution. And if you look at the fly posted 17 demands which of the Communist Party, which Marx and Engels actually got fly posted around uh, in uh, the German states, as opposed to the manifesto, which went nowhere except the Prussian police archives. Uh, the fly posting, which they signed, which got Engels into terrible trouble in his hometown, uh, is a straightforward list of those demands, all of which are impeccably liberal. So you've got to have allies. I mean, Marx was, you know, uh, politically astute. And it's, uh, it's, you know, he was making political intervention. So I don't think there's a problem there. Liberals may have thought there was a problem and they were nervous. Nice, thank you very much. Well, I want to turn to Ryan Offman. Can we unmute Ryan for his question? Hello, hello. Hi Ryan, we hear you. Awesome. So my question was kind of on your description of Marx's relationship with science. Mm -hmm. I, I think there was a slide on it earlier. And I, I very much agree that when I'm, when I'm reading his descriptions, I think it's a very, very like cynical um, view of how science works and that very well might be the case. Do you think it's more of a general, something about the nature of science that Marx thinks is fundamentally going to kind of boil down to capitalism or is it more about the specific institutions that Marx was kind of raised on. Like, I'm sure he, the university he was at had a quite demanding and quite specific way of dealing with science. Uh, thank you, great question. The university that he went to had no science at all. Uh, so in the sense uh, that we have it, it was a traditional unreformed university. So I would go back to the educational milieu of um, the uh, 1820s, 1830s. Uh, and this is continuous uh, up to and beyond uh, the 48 uh, revolutions. And it's uh, quite an intellectual revolution led from Berlin uh, and from the, um, the uh, Prussian Royal University there. And it's not from the traditional universities um, like Bonn. Uh, so, um, Wissenschaft and Wissenschaftlich um, in the German of the time, this is a rigorous study of anything. I mean, it, Hegel's system building on any subject, whether metaphysics or nature uh, or logic was uh, Wissenschaftlich because it was rigorous. Uh, and indeed, modern science, uh, you know, accepts the same thing. It's supposed to be rigorous and logical in the first instance. So what you get um, from uh, the um, more sort of Anglo-centric and uh, later uh, um, reformed German universities is a conception of science that accepts a physical materialism, which can only really uh, get to be 
respectable after Darwin and you know people have got away with uh, a kind of separation in metaphysical terms between uh, faith and the uh, material uh, world and as that is becoming more technologically successful and um, engineering is uh, engineering and early uh, physical material science were all the same thing anyway electricity physics and uh, all of that stuff if you um, go back through the history of science and technology uh, they're all the same thing from about the 1760s 1780s uh, onwards so these things all have to have a use uh, and the experimentation has to be uh, paid for uh, and it's often quite uh, difficult to do. So I would approach this uh, very much historically and try to make sure that we're not projecting a kind of uh, scientific materialism, matter in motion and mathematical methods from the 1870s and 1880s and onwards uh, back onto something that really didn't exist uh, anywhere uh, very much um, and in Marx's time. So I'll just pull the 1844 manuscripts out of a hat here. This is another sort of editorial uh, kind of geeky point. These are kind of ripped out of Marx's notebooks uh, and turned into a manuscript work uh, in the 1920s. But um, even so, you can see there he actually just says, uh, that um, in so far as we have Wissenschaftlich study of the material world, uh, it's driven by and uh, you know goes into technologies of ordinary life, and that's what industry is. Marx is very fixated on technologies and therefore economics of ordinary life in whatever stage of society we're looking at. So. Uh, he quite specifically says that his overall outlook, um, which is uh, historical all the way down, uh, includes uh, all previous forms and stages, if you like, or formations of society in terms of the way uh, that people interacted together to get along in the uh, material world. It just takes different forms at different times. But um, he's quite happy, and this is actually in capital with the um, Stone Age, Bronze Age and Iron Age, that, that actually gets a footnote and that was a new thing uh, in the um, 1860s series, quite interested in Stone Age uh, technologies and it might sound odd to call this Stone Age science, but in terms of being rigorous and logical and apparently not doing what uh, uh, baboons or uh, apes do when they use simple tools. I mean, he's definitely on something. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ryan. We have one more student with a question. Can we go to Jonas Kilga? Hi. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Um, thank you. Uh, so you mentioned censorship a lot uh, in your talk uh, and in um, the text that you sent out, you also said he published Das Kapital in Hamburg originally because the censors were uh, more lenient. Um, and I think when you're reading Marx, it is quite a, pe a peculiar language, and maybe that's just 1860s German, um, but knowing about the censorship uh, or that he had to grapple with it, I was wondering concretely um, how Capital was affected uh, by censorship, uh, if there are any, if, if there's textual evidence to look out for where you can sense that Marx was sort of trying to write around certain um, certain stipulations put in place by censors? Well, I think there's an awful lot of that. I mean, you have to put yourself in the mind of the censor of the time and then in Marx's mind to try to figure out what he's not writing. Um, but uh, there's quite a lot of quotation from published sources, some of which is quite critical of capitalism. So um, that, that's a, a move. I mean, uh, none of these moves are guaranteed to get around the uh, censor. I was particularly struck in reading part eight, uh, again, that we get to an apocalyptic moment of capitalist collapse uh, where he describes the uh, 
proletariat uh, overthrowing uh, the regime of private property and says it's, a, it's the negation of the negation. Well, this is sort of pounced on in the uh, post-1920 uh, world of Marx's reception as showing that he still valued Hegel. Uh, I think this is really a way of getting around the um, censorship by, by um, not saying too much about this, uh, you know, volcanic change in the social order that he's envisaging and quickly covering it up with a uh, kind of meaningless philosophical uh, phrase that doesn't say much of anything and then moving swiftly on. All of this uh, of course only comes in part eight by which time you assume the censor has got very bored and uh, uh, censors were known um, you know to read kind of the beginning and you know a bit of the end and kind of flip through because um, you know they, they're on a paycheck they had books to get through so uh, Marx is pretty successful with that and it's word of mouth where you go for your publishers and there's a lot of uh, that in correspondence uh, about where to go and who will put up the money for it and how to get the money whether you split the cost with the publisher and how much risk the publisher is going to take uh, and all that kind of stuff but publication was not free it was censored and as I point out uh, they were lucky to get through the Russian censorship um, not least uh, again in a sense on the kind of foreign angle there's an awful lot of foreign writers in there so we don't have to worry very much much and uh, uh, capitalism was a wholly uh, foreign idea um, in Russia in the early 1870s. It was so new, uh, the censor hadn't really heard of it, didn't know what to do with it, assumed it was of no interest in a really autocratic, medieval, um, you know, obsessive uh, feudal setup. <laughs> so said it was kind of a tedious work on a subject nobody knows anything about. So you kind of have to rely on censorial um, ignorance. It's not as well developed as censorship has been in other places. Thanks, Terrell. I'm sure all the Hegelians in the audience will have been interested. In the <laughs> Hegel speak in the book was an attempt to get around the, the censors. Um, I would like to open up the floor for questions from uh, all the spectators now. We have some in the chat. I wonder if we can actually unmute the folks and have them ask their questions. Let's try. Yasmin, if you're on, we have a question from Sarah Wexler. I think we can find Sarah Wexler and unmute. Hi, hey, Sarah, you should be able to unmute yourself. Hello. Hi, we hear you. Okay, yeah, I recently read William Clare Roberts' book, um, mm. Marx's Inferno, and he's also kind of trying to politically contextualize capital. And so I was just wondering if you, if what you thought about his take that um, Marx is sort of advocating for some sort of republicanism um, when he's writing capital. Well, I thoroughly recommend the book. Um, there are not a whole lot of books on this subject I recommend, but that's clearly one. Uh, I think his take on the political intervention is wonderful. Uh, it's quite clever. He says it's written within the context of the International Working Men's Association, to which ladies were admitted, um, and that it's really getting at Proudhonists, although Proudhon is hardly mentioned in the text. So I think that's a little bit of the uh, parody satire uh, angle. Marx had already done a, a sort of straight up satirical attack on Proudhon, so there's not too much point doing it again. Um, better just to show what he wanted to show, which is that he was very much better at it than Proudhon, and instead of riling the Proudhonians, he would kind of pull a fast one uh, on them. So I, I think Will is absolutely right about uh, that. Um, I'm less on board with uh, the republicanism thing. Uh, quite a lot of people thought that was a little bit unnecessary or projected. Um, I'm, you know, more inclined to stick with popular sovereignty and liberalism, although they are part of the same dialogue. So I don't go all the way with Will on that one. Um, I think the Dante's Inferno thing is quite clever. 
um, it shows an awful lot of really geeky, nerdy grad student research. He taught himself, you know, the whole world of Dantayana in order to do this. So it's an awesome uh, thing to take on board. Um, for me, it didn't actually add that much to my reading of Capital to see it passed out uh, as a kind of tribute to Dante. It's also been passed out as a kind of tribute to Hegel's logic. Uh, I think it's got a logic of its own. Um, one of the uh, points I make in the text is that where is capital is actually quite a good question because it's a project I think from 1842 and from late 1843 when he uh, reads Engels's outlines of a critique of political economy and just goes electric. He then sketches out a plan for a critique of political economy and spends the rest of his life on that. And we've got uh, a lot of manuscript build up and reading notes and notebooks uh, that lead up to this. And we've got the um, intense uh, activity 1857 uh, onwards that got published eventually as Grudrasse. We've got uh, drafts of Capital Volume 1. Um, and we've got his rewrites and um, new editions and the French translation uh, of it. Um, and uh, so therefore, Capital One is more like a taster volume or a snapshot. And we know he was kind of pressured as usual by family and friends to get something out. So it's not thrown together, but it's, um, you know, he had, he had to make a stop with it and decide what was going to be in it as a single volume work. There's also a bit of a health warning on volumes two and three. Volume three is from manuscripts that predate volume one. Volume two is in a very rough state and Engels' uh, editing is subject to a lot of critique, not all of it unsympathetic. It's, you know, editors have a hard job when authors don't make up their mind and say contradictory things. And I think that's a big clue about Marx. He was really curious and really exploratory. Uh, and, you know, was, didn't feel obliged to have a dogmatic view unless he'd really thought about it. And then I don't think he particularly wanted to be dogmatic. And said in a letter that he wasn't a Marxist. Um, well, no, I'll, I'll correct you if I may on that. Please. Engels reports in two letters uh, that he heard Marx say it two different ways in French. Hmm. Got it? <laughs> Got it. Let's turn to some other questions. I'm going to go uh, through the chat now. So let's see if we can unmute. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes, absolutely. Welcome. Okay, so um, this is a question about the labor theory of value. I was think I was I was wondering what you think uh, about the labor theory of value, or and whether it has some grain of truth to it today. Uh, almost everything has a grain of truth, uh, and I certainly think that. Um, I think if we have to go back to political economy, and as I said, the puzzle that they were solving at the time. Uh, and the way that they chose labor as a common factor. And they were presenting a puzzle about profit and solving it or trying to solve it in very um, Aristotelian terms. So it's a very classical uh, problem that they're trying to solve with uh, tools of moralizing of uh, philosophy, which is somewhat connected with the empirical world. That is, they took uh, human labor to be an empirical kind of uh, object. Uh, that uh, works in that kind of neo-Aristotelian framework, as far as it goes. Uh, excuse me, there's a couple of chapters in the postmodern Marx um, that show how it works in that context. Uh, and why if you shift your ground to modern physics or a more, uh, you know, post Aristotelian materialist uh, physical understanding of the world of, based on physics and chemistry, um, it really doesn't work well at all. Uh, even just empirically, it's not clear 
that there's something that we can specify or define uh, as labor in the human context as opposed to leisure. Uh, though people talk as if there is. Um, we can define things like wage work and employment, ask anybody in a tax office what uh, employment is and they will tell you, but they probably won't tell you what work is or what labor is. Uh, it's a convenient sort of label. One student said, well, what about donkeys <laughs> and animals who work? We have a lot of working, hard working animals uh, around the world. Why are they not, in, you know, since they're doing the same kinds of things the humans are doing, we've got uh, animals that are working for us biologically now. Um, and in modern terms, I don't think there are very good answers to those questions. Alternatively, we can turn it around and say, well, let's look at the world of production from the point of view of the human being and what human beings are uh, required to do because they can't, subside, uh, they, they can't subsist uh, otherwise. And then I think we're much more on board uh, with the theory of exploitation, which is really where Marx's um, concept of labor power um, and surplus value is going. He's developing a concept of exploitation. There are various ways you can uh, construct empirical proxies for this, and there's quite a lot of mileage in doing that. Marxist economists have um, uh, done that in very respectable work, which gets a very good audience. Uh, it also gets, an, uh, it gets ignored uh, because it doesn't start out uh, with the concepts and the methods uh, that more orthodox uh, economists are used to working with. I think Piketty is a nice point of compromise there. Uh, he's quite interested in human beings and the things that they're required to do within the productive setup that capitalism uh, causes uh, them to be enmeshed in whether they like it or not. And some of them like it and some of them don't. Uh, and uh, people change their views about it as life goes along. You may think it's great when you're employed and not when you're not. Um, so uh, there's all those things going on. I quite like David Harvey's approach, which is really to zoom in at volume two stage and look at capital as flows and in a sense uh, just uh, kind of put the whole labor value thing on the back burner uh, and look at capital flows and then come back around to uh, let's look at workers and their uh, kinds of conditions. So there are lots of things to be done with. I think it is quite difficult to pick up capital volume one and start on page one and figure out what is going on and why things are problematic and puzzling and what the concepts mean and what they don't mean, given what's happened in the um, mm -hmm. 180 years or so uh, afterwards. And we don't want to give people too much of a fright so that they don't try it. <laughs> your, own, your own quote, I do think, should come back in here. Okay. It's, it's worth it, as all difficult things are. And since we have to live under capital, it can't be worse than that. <laughs> I want to go now to a question that was posed a little while ago by Martin Bradbury. I wonder if we can unmute Martin, if he's still in the... Hello? Hi, Martin. Hello. Uh, so my question is about um, the relationship between Hegel and Marx. So uh, Hegel's already been mentioned. Um, and from some of my readings of primarily the, uh, from the Frankfurt School, so like Adorno and Marcuse. Uh, I've come to sort of understand Marx's project as basically an attempt to radicalise Hegel. Um, there's a, some, uh, there's a, a, there's a section in um, the Economic Philosophic Manuscripts, of course, where it's dedicated entirely to criticising Hegel. There's a famous quote from Marx where he talks about how when he was uh, writing the Grundries, so he happened to leaf through Hegel again. So this is something that keeps coming up through the history of Marxism. But um, it's also been countered, of course, by other schools. So just, um, the one that comes to mind, I suppose, is like the analytical Marxists. 
Jews were like, we, we know bullshit Marxists, we don't want to call that Hegelian speculative philosophy. So my question really is, to what extent is this idea that Marx was trying to radicalise Hegel something that Marx would probably have agreed with, or is it a distortion that's been brought into it by Marx's interpreters like Marcuse and people that came afterwards? Well, th uh, thank you very much for that question. It's all of those things. So if we go back to the beginning, uh, who was Hegel in the first place? Hegel was an academic philosopher. Uh, he uh, published a lot to the German speaking audience. He was famous as a critic of Kant. Uh, he uh, wrote uh, a philosophical system which was going to make Wissenschaftlich a rigorous sense of everything that ever was uh, and will be everything you could possibly want to know about. He was famous in his own time, much admired. His disciples collected his writings and filled out his uh, collected works in the 1830s. And he was, uh, as we say in Britain, uh, by the 1830s, a national treasure. Uh, he had become uh, the East Prussian uh, philosopher of choice. Uh, he was there in the public view. Uh, since the public was not allowed to have a view about very much, and there wasn't even really supposed to be uh, a public interested in politics, uh, because he was so famous and so famously ambiguous, and because he covered everything, including history and politics. He was a way in to the politics of the time. He was the politics of the time in that you could discuss it in a coded form by talking about him. So uh, there was no need to radicalize him. He was already uh, radicalized by uh, the 1830s and he was already conservatized by the 1830s. This debate was already raging and uh, he was blamed in the culture war of the time for uh, destroying Christian faith um, and, and um, preaching atheism, uh, but also defending the Prussian state and orthodox confessional Christianity. So this shows you the advantages of ambiguity and also the advantages of being dead um, and of being a national treasure. So he was the national philosopher uh, and how to read and understand him, particularly what he says about um, the, uh, on political subjects in the philosophy of right is uh, political philosophy, philosophy of the state and society and the family. He's covered all those things. Uh, what you think he's saying uh, is itself a political issue. And this is debated uh, and published on in the alternative press and in the official press and professors are appointed by the state and kicked out by the state to take uh, the right view on this philosophical subject. So um, the uh, 20th century reception from the 1920s onwards doesn't quite see this. The people who are do it are already academic uh, philosophers and are not reading the politics of the time. They're coming at Marx, making him as a, a philosopher, which was already going on in the 1880s. Um, rather weirdly, uh, Engels, of course, wanted to make him a materialist philosopher and therefore on board with the uh, physical science of the time and a, a Hegelian systematizing philosopher to keep him in the German mainstream, doing both of these at the same time uh, in his works of the 1880s when he revisits the 1840s. And this, of course, not really very accurate 40 years on in his recollections. So this is a complicated story of overlapping receptions. Uh, one can make uh, Marx into a, a Hegelian. I think it's really part of the politics of the 1920s where people are um, trying to read Marx outside 
of the orthodox Marxist materialist uh, framework of deterministic laws. They're picking up on Hegel, who, whom they assume can only be read in an idealist way. They don't quite want to say that Marx is an idealist. He's just a Hegelian. They pick up on the young Hegelian discourse, um, which they can find um, in the Marx archive and then do some research on, uh, which had been um, left over and ignored. Engels doesn't really revive it. And actually nobody revives it because everybody's on board with materialist science until the 1920s. And we get this uh, Hegel revival, both in um, Weimar Germany and in France. So some of the most uh, influential French Hegelian reception of Marx uh, comes in lectures actually given at the Sorbonne. Uh, so I give them some credit in that they're, they're reading Marx outside the materialist, orthodox, deterministic framework. Um, on the other hand, I think they mistake uh, where those works and texts are actually coming from. And it kind of depoliticizes it as a, what I think is actually an exciting political intervention. We have four questions in the chat. I think I'm going to count uh, the fourth from Marco Lada as pretty well answered. He or they ask whether dialectics and critique were terms in common use, given what you've said about Hegel and the milieu in which Marx was writing. I think it's pretty clear that they were. Um, but Marco, if you have more specific questions about that, you could certainly write Professor Carver or myself. Then let's go to Isaac Kirk. David off if he's still in the room. Yeah, well, hi, um, Professor Carver. I just wanted to know that like there's so much imagery in Capital. There's like tables dancing, there's vampires. He references like Robinson Crusoe in what's my favorite footnote of Capital. Um, mm -hmm. I just wanna know what you make of all the imagery. Like is he, uh, is this like reaching to describe things that like political economy doesn't have a language for, that Marx doesn't have a language for, or is it more like just for the sake of the reader, like um, what do you make of all this imagery? Well, I think that's a really interesting question. And um, my story on this is that in the early 1980s, I gave a word by word, chapter by chapter class with um, someone else's seminar class uh, on capital. And I've, I gave it several years running. Um, and so I got a little bit daydreamy um, going through uh, the book, you know, chapter one for the nth time. So I got out my little yellow highlighter and just started highlighting the images because I was interested in metaphor uh, at the time. And I began to realize that there's a whole world of occult imagery there, some of which is biblical from Revelation, um, and some of which just derives from, you know, the occult, like the tables turning, there's uh, famously the vampires, there's werewolves. So I, I got up my highlighter and I made a list. And I wrote a short article which was uh, published in the then Times Literary Supplements. And it's one of the chapters in the postmodern Marx, which you might enjoy. Um, and the further answer is I thought, well, what is all this doing there? That's just not just to entertain us. There must be some kind of thread. So I think the thread goes like this. It's a classic kind of enlightenment argument against ignorance and superstition. And it's um, coded um, against uh, religion uh, in general. And it does actually tie into political economy. So the argument goes like this. Okay, enlightenment, uh, post-Hegelian liberals of the time, those who've read David Friedrich Strauss on, on the life of Jesus and don't uh, buy the literal truth of the Christian confessional anymore. Uh, we know you're all past that. Look, what I'm showing you um, is that the world of commodity production, uh, which we're looking at through empirical testimony and through 
uh, works of political economy uh, is just as mystificatory and just as performative as we might say these days. That is, commodities are, as Marx says, really strange. You just think they're something in a shop with a price tag, but let's try to think about them as really weird. Uh, how is it that they have a price on them? What does price mean? Uh, he says prices are the language that commodities speak to each other. This is getting really strange and stranger. How is it that we have markets uh, with uh, forces moving by themselves, with which we have created, that control our lives and which we bow down and worship? This is the fetishism of commodities. Well, fetishism at the time wasn't Freudian. Uh, it was uh, the projection of human uh, qualities onto stone idols such that they command the humans or seem to and the humans believe that the stone idols have magical powers and money and monetized behavior uh, and uh, all the things that neoliberals complain about uh, and all the boxes we have to tick on the tax forms are just all instances of being trapped within this uh, performative uh, ritualistic uh, world of uh, commodity concepts that we all believe in because we have to. But hey, look, historically, this was made up historically. There was a time when we didn't have money, we didn't have commodities, we didn't have capital. We got on, we traded things, we produced things. Uh, let's not go back there, but let's realize that commodity production and capitalism don't have to be here uh, forever. So there's a historical argument going along there, along with an intellectual argument, which is that, okay, um, uh, woke up liberals, you don't believe in this religious stuff anymore, uh, apply the same argument to the commodity stuff. It's just as weird as believing in the incarnation uh, and the Holy Spirit and the Immaculate Conception. It's just it's got dressed up as political economy or economics. And we don't have to bow down and worship once we realize it's a collection of uh, human concepts that we act out. So there is a substantive way that some people could have recognized, and it's part of the satire. Um, it's just not, uh, because it works both ways. I mean, it's outlandish to say that capitalists are werewolves and capitalism is a vampire sucking the blood of the workers. But there's loads of empirical stuff put in there to show exactly that. And Marx quotes horrifying stuff by the time you get to part eight about what happens in the Indian so-called mutiny uh, and other things like that from the maths, you know, from the writings of colonialists and anti-colonialists uh, themselves. So the whole thing is very joined up. You just have to get all the way through to part eight uh, to see uh, how it works where horror meets horror. We have two more questions. I'm mindful of the time people in the east, on the East Coast want to get to dinner and people in the UK want to get to bed. So let me just give you a, a summary of the last two questions. One is from Ali Ekdal, who's a student in the seminar, and this follows up on the last things you were saying. What do you think about the theological rhetoric in Capital that Marx occasionally uses, like quoting Jesus, they know not what they do? Is this um, a satire? he asks, or is this uh, a putting himself into a messianic position? <laughs> and the last question is, going back to what you said about the, the Communist Manifesto, isn't it unfair to characterize the demands of the manifesto as liberal, given the politics of the time it was opposed by liberals, as you said? Wouldn't it be uh, more likely to think of it, I guess he means as communist or at least supporting the workers' struggle. Uh, okay, I think um, anything from, the, from uh, anything about that purports to come from religion that's said by Marx with a straight face is totally satirical. Uh, he uh, arrived at uh, atheism very early on, and this put him on the, you know, the radical edge of everybody. Uh, you could be seriously persecuted. You wouldn't, uh, you couldn't get a job. You you couldn't do 
do anything much of anything uh as an art now atheist if you know word got around about you uh, so that is all totally satirical it belongs to the same thing uh as um putting um you know, and this is a powerful argument. I mean, the whole business of uh, economic production under capitalism uh, in the same box uh, as religious faith seems to be a serious category mistake. We're used to keeping them in separate boxes. Oh, well, um, I go to the shops, but then I have my faith uh, elsewhere. And Marx is saying, well, look, it's the same kind of socially made up phenomenon. Um, and so, I mean, Marx went the whole way uh, with Feuerbach and Strauss, which is that religion generally, and Christianity, of course, as part of that, is a projection of human ideas, concepts, and values onto things that are either stone idols or don't exist, or are truths, um, you know, that are supposedly come from books, and uh, all of which require human interpreters in authority structures. So, um, I mean, that's uh, deeply satirical. What's interesting is uh, how how learned he was on Christianity and Bible study. I mean, he, he really knew it off uh, completely and he's uh, completely expert with it and it's great language. And it's another reason why uh, I think the Lutheran Bible is uh, really the key to his prose. Um, the uh, other question about liberalism, I think we have to go back again to the politics of the time when being liberal, the German speaking state wasn't being liberal, it was being treasonous. Um, you know, you could be put in jail for advocating popular sovereignty, for advocating constitutionalism. Um, it was horrendous. And remember that the French Revolution of 1830 is, uh, you know, easily living memory. I mean, uh, you know, it's their own lifetimes. I mean, the, the rulers east of the Rhine are terrified that's going to happen to them. The mob are going to come and get them, demand more votes for more people. Um, and rather unfortunately for them, Louis Philippe um, sort of ran off, um, didn't defend his throne. He ran off to Twickenham um, in, in London and set up his kingdom in exile and we've got to be pals with Queen Victoria. So um, that's, you know, th th they were really terrified of this. And um, so to come back with our idea that we're all in a system where um, liberalism is, you know, part of the mainstream, when, you know, the opposite is communism, really mistakes the politics of the period uh, quite badly. So those, those demands are revolutionary demands for constitutionalism. And they, those people who signed those demands got put on trial. And Marx argued his way out of a jury conviction and got tried in absentia. Um, and some of these people went to prison and they went into exile. And they didn't all go to nice, you know, places even as nice as Soho in London, which wasn't very nice. This is a way to just pause a much longer discussion about Marx and his radicality. You've given us a really radical reading, I think, and a lot to think about. I want to thank you very much for your time and your effort and all your work over many years to be able to sum things up so beautifully for us. Uh, th thank you. It's been an absolute delight. I've enjoyed the questions, obviously, very considerably. Uh, I'm tempted to go back to share screen and uh, show you the, uh, the book with the volcano on the front. Uh, that was uh, actually uh, my Id idea in that uh, the publishers wanted um, nature on the cover. And uh, I thought, well, nature, I looked at their covers, which were all gardens which was, I thought, well, that isn't going to do. What garden is, you know, Marx going to uh, evoke? So um, I thought, well, let's go for metaphor. So I thought about the great wave, a tidal wave, a tsunami, you know, some sort of unstoppable force. Um, and the designers came back um, and they said, well, here's some great waves, including Hiroshige. Um, who's out of copyright. And they said, but it does make it look like a surfing book. Um, and, I, and they said, well, how about volcanoes? And I said, hey, that's a great idea. So they came up with a volcano and a few weeks later, I happened to be reading Marx's 
uh, Speech to the People's Paper, which is a very early work written in English, I think not entirely by him. Uh, he actually talks about uh, the forthcoming union of the proletariat um, as a volcanic eruption. Uh, so, um, we hope I, I, the, I, the book channel is Marx. I mean, that's obvious. Anyway, thank, thank you very much. It's been delightful. Thank you, Terrell. Given the amount of people who were in the audience, it sound, seems like the magma is getting hot. <laughs> I want to say to everyone before they go uh, that this series, so beautifully kicked off by Professor Carver, is going to go on next week. Marcello Musto, Musto from York University, is going to be here. We will have William Clare Roberts talking about the literary dimensions of the text. We have uh, people talking about reproductive labor, about racial capital, um, about the economic questions. So I hope you tune back in for the rest of the series. Thanks very much. Thank you.